Everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms, the entire universe, might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist Podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Okay, and we're beginning. Okay, uh, welcome to another episode of the Simulationist Podcast. This is number eleven. Uh, what do we call it? Oh, go ahead, iteration. This or is Simulation Zero One One. That's right, Simulation Zero. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it, today is the twentieth of November in two thousand and twelve. The world is still. Uh, here, but um, we're expecting an end of time to happen any day now. You're hoping. I've got a kid on the way, and there is no way I want to face the apocalypse with a week old baby. Hmm. That that's just that seems unnecessarily cruel. Okay. I think I think if there is going to be a divine apocalypse happening, I think we're going to be able to see it by the lack of babies coming out first, and then once we get everybody, you know, out, of the, you know, at least to the toddler stage, then the apocalypse goes on. You know, because toddlers can hurt you with Lego pretty badly, so they'll be like tossing down caltrops or something against devils. I don't know. Okay. I haven't read much about it. I'm just making this up as I go. Uh, so, so you're of the opinion that there's a benevolent being out there uh, preparing to destroy the world. I'm thinking if that you can indeed predict the future, there's other stuff going on. So, yeah, if if there is a, a, a mandated apocalypse about to happen, there's probably other forces at play, in which case we'll say there's a, a, a maybe one benevolent side. I would hate it if it just winds up being like like, like the blood war demon versus devil come up. Yeah, that could be uh, bad. <laughs> Although, if it was more of like a Christian devil versus something like uh, the Aztec-style demon underworld... I wouldn't mind watching that. That that sounds like it could be entertaining to to see. You know, like if yeah, they're doing it on it, reality TV. Yeah, I, that's reality TV. I could get interested in. Oh wow! Now I hope the apocalypse does happen. In some interesting, con- you know, non-conventional manner. Uh, sure. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Sure. I mean, well, I, uh, speaking of ac- apocalypse, I mean, we do have the. Well, we always have violence going on in the Middle East, so, you know, that's on my mind. But um, but it seems like rational heads are prevailing at this point, and, and maybe a ceasefire is in the works. Okay, well, yeah, they say that. So we'll, we'll, we're going to keep an eye on that, but you can turn to other news sources to learn the latest, because I'm sure that it, by the time you're listening to this, there's something else happening. Oh, and I am 95% certain nothing is happening on the Hill of Armageddon, so there will be no official Armageddon happening from that. Uh, is that like a national park now? Um, I'm not sure if it's a park, just a region with a hill. Um, I've only read about it as an abstract. I've never seen it with an image. Like, this is the hill where the end of time happens. Yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've seen, like, I think Richard Dawkins went there in a documentary once, and he stood in the valley. It was basically deserted. I mean... It was kind of a half desert, half shrubland. Well, who area. who wants to be at? You know, it's like I'm going to set up my house just offside of where everything is supposed to start ending. Well, I think it just happens to be an area that's not a great. You know, there's no rivers nearby. Although, you would think there there must be a river there somewhere. There's something if you dig deep enough or channel far enough, it'll go. I suppose. Yeah, it's that, it's not far from the Dead Sea. I know that. Well, that doesn't really help much for irrigation, does it? <laughs> Yeah. Wait, what was I talking about? Okay, anyways, uh, yeah. end of the world... Uh, <laughs> may or may not happen. We're not going to call it. We're not even going to split odds like it's a 50-50 or a 75-25 odds, but uh, just oh, so you know, well, it hasn't ended yet. I, I guess I, yeah, I guess I'll go out a limb and say it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> mm, well, if there is one thing I have learned from uh, the lessons taught to us in the, uh, the Watchmen uh, series is that uh, it just keeps going. There is no end. It mm. just keeps going. 
that's for better or worse. That's okay. Yeah. There are worse lessons to take from that series. I'll say that. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I have to get into Watchmen because. Um, oh, I have it. It's something I think everybody should at least try reading annually. No. <laughs> well, the uh, the artist, you know, and and uh, the writer put in so many little things. Each of them ne- themselves needed to read it about a half dozen times before they caught what each other was doing for small little uh, signals and hints. Oh, that's so cool. And so I figure if the people that made it need to read it a couple times, we should at least take the time to read it every now and then ourselves. <laughs> Recommended <laughs> reading list. Top of it, Watchmen. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well. It's a little grim. I think that's the biggest criticism I have about it. But I think it works for its age. So there we go. Okay, um, um, let's see. So uh, do, are we ready to start with topics? Um, maybe we should just uh, do a quick update on how far behind we are on uh, the National uh, Novel Writing Month. Oh, the National Novel Writing Month. Um, well, I've been telling people I have 3,500 words, so that's what I'll tell you. Um... I have not managed to write much between working. Cause yeah, yeah, I've got work. I've got the job hunt for better work. Uh, I did have a vacation in Vegas, so of course I got no writing done there. <laughs> it's okay. I don't think you should actually call it a vacation. It was an experience in Vegas. Oh yeah. No one goes to Vegas and comes back relaxed. They yeah. come back with memories. I mean, we we were talking about your trip to Vegas. But I, I suppose that's good podcast fodder if you have any good uh, stories from what happened uh, hmm. there in, in Vegas. Um, I technically came out ahead on gambling because I found a $5 chip on the floor and was allowed to keep it. Really? Oh. Yeah. Like, what did you... Did you, like, take it to the front desk and be like, I found this? Uh, no, actually, there was, like, an empty uh, roulette thing. I mean, my brother and I were, were saying, well, okay, we have a little spare time. We'll spend $20 on the roulette. It's basic mathematics. I'm a biologist. He's a physicist. Let's see which science is better. Turns out he lost his twenty dollars. I got to break even. So, haha. Oh, that's weird. I would have thought. Well, I, I think a statistician should be the one who wins. Well, yes, but the other brother decided to go into business, so he couldn't be that third person to break the tie. Although I, I suppose anybody that's had experience around the uh, gaming table sort of thing should be able to work out the math fairly easily. Uh, well, if you if you're not like mathophobic, well, is, which a lot of people are. Well, it's not hard to see that half the numbers are red, half the numbers are black, except for the two zero and double zero. So you have a, just under fifty fifty odds of winning if you put you know your money on black or red. Same for odds or evens. Yeah, yeah. So and it's about a little a little over two percent if you go on a specific number. Um, so if you are going to play um, roulette, the like. Well, the, the the number one strategy is don't play because it's stacked against you. The number two strategy would be I chip, pick doesn't matter which either black or red because that way you have that highest possible fifty fifty chance. Although I had seen one person, he he was doing a lot of betting on a, uh, groups of numbers, like he'd bet on a series of four, then he'd bet on a series of six that overlapped with the four, and he was covering effectively uh, one twelfth of the region with multiple overlapping bets. And he was okay. coming out ahead on that one. He managed to leave the table with an extra two hundred dollars. Um, I don't know if that was luck or if that was actually some sort of statistical, you know, doubling up on your odds. But uh, he, he he beat the pants off me on that sort of thing. Uh, I was only yeah. able to hold my own. Well, I I would say it's luck, but uh, I don't know that enough about roulette to know there isn't a system that you can use. To <laughs> No, I'm, I'm sure it's luck. I'm sure there's no possible system to come out ahead. Well, I think it's, for something like that, it's all a, a system for minimizing your losses. Which actually should bring you to the second rule about if you're playing a game of chance, don't play for long. The longer you play, the more the math in the long term starts stacking against you. Yeah, it basically averages out because you get uh, the law of large numbers and um, it, all, yeah, it, all, it averages out your wins and losses and you come out to more closer to that magic number that the casinos work off of which is you know that little margin turns into millions of dollars for them that's okay I made I made everybody's money back when we went to the buffet uh, yes and right. let's face it that's some of the greatest thing you can see in Vegas when you go to the buffets there you're ruined for buffets anywhere else you'll come back home you'll see them putting on the buffet back home and you go oh I see what you're trying to do that's so cute 
keep trying, keep trying, but it's not going to be the same. <laughs> it's true, though. Their buffets are magnificent. Ah, uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, other than that, not too much I should report. You're not, gonna, you're not willing to go in uh, public in uh, some of these stories? Oh, I did see the Hoover Dam while I was there, though. Uh, the Hoover Dam. It yeah. crushed me a little inside to see it, though. It was so big, so vast, and so functional in its size that a part of me realized I am never going to do anything as grand as what this is. And I just looked at it, and it was like that that uh, that thing, uh, look upon my works, O oh mighty, and despair. I'm not even mighty, and I looked upon that work, and it's just, they did this almost a hundred years ago. Yeah, it was in the 30s, so it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's 80 years ago, and they did something so great. I will never accomplish anything in a, of appropriate equivalency to what they did with the Hoover Dam. Well, when, I mean, when you talk about they, I mean, like, you're comparing yourself to, you know, a, what, 100,000 people, 10,000, 50,000 people? I'll, I'll, I mean, we can just say this, the government of, from the 1930s in America. Uh, yeah, well... I'm just wondering, like, how many actual people were involved in the project? I mean, there there was probably there would have been. They had know, to make an entire town just to house them. That okay. town still lasts to this day. So we're talking tens of thousands of people, probably. There was some just cycle were, over, yeah. If if you weren't, a, well, it was the 30s, you know, during the Depression. If you didn't fit with what they wanted for a worker, they would toss you out and get someone new one because there was enough spare workers. Yeah, and and a lot of people died too. Well, not a lot compared to some of the things like uh, like putting the railroad through British Columbia was a horrible, dangerous experience with a lot of explosives. Hmm. This was a lot of work with cooling tubes and uh, let's see, it was like a dump truck worth of cement every ninety seconds. Ooh. Yeah, for like four years, um, they were working twenty four hours a day to build it. So, like, you know, I'm trying to think of something that I can say to, to comfort you. Um, like, I don't I don't know if you'll ever reach, like, the point where, you know, there would have been a master architect or something, like... Who, by the way, got a sizable bonus, even, even now it would be considered a sizable bonus, for bringing the whole thing in under budget and quicker than expected. That man deserved the bonus. Well, so, um, so when you say, like, you know, I looked at that and I thought, I will never accomplish something... Like, are you thinking of yourself in the shoes of that kind of master architect? Or? Well, I must say, I mean, I've played games where you can construct things, and I don't think I've constructed anything, even in a fictionalized setting, quite as grand as what this person has. Interesting. It makes me want to go into Dwarf Fortress and design a master fort that is completely unassailable and a death trap and, and something that would boggle the minds of any who saw it, just to say, at least I did it on this style. You know, I need to get you playing Minecraft, because, like, oh, it's so, like, you can do stuff like that in Minecraft. Yes, that is one thing. I do have to wind up uh, that. I, I've meant to do that, but that costs money, and I'm cheap, and I have a kid on the way. Kids aren't cheap either, hmm. so. Might have to figure out a way to, um, well, get our listeners to donate us some money somehow. So what is it for a copy of it? It's like $15 for a Minecraft um, copy? Well, it's probably around 20 but I'm not sure. So if we can get 200 readers donating 10 cents a piece, woo, I can play. Now all we need is 200 donating readers, or listeners, so hey. Uh, although, yeah, by the time you listen to this, we may or may not have our donating infrastructure set up, so please be patient. And Don't worry, I think I can comfort myself, though, because looking at the, uh, the Hoover Dam, it did, in some sense, also comfort me knowing that this was the work of man. This is the word, and not just one person, because okay. they, they do have, there's that one place down in Florida where the guy managed to build like a castle and all these things just by himself and the very knowledgeable use of levers and counter levers. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Or if you listen to some people, aliens and maybe mental <laughs> techniques. Yeah. But for all we know, it was actually just really good use of levers. This guy was a master craftsman on his own. He was one person, but the Hoover Dam was not one person. You can say, this is the hand of man that built it. So by being, you know, of the, you know, a, a human as well, I can say that this is the work of my people, and so I am, I am somehow ennobled by seeing what people coming together can do. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'd say I would agree with that. I'd say yeah, we can say we're part of humanity. 
Um, we're, we can even say that we're part of the, the North American continent. We're not quite um, like U.S. citizens, but Canadians and Americans are very similar. We're tight, yo. We're kind of part of the same economy, part of the same, like, we're... Well, thankfully, we weren't so close to the economy that when the American economy dipped, we didn't hit so bad a dip ourselves. Um, well, yeah, that's a small uh, comfort. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, that means that we get to you know recover a little quicker, and hopefully that helps bring them up, too. And I think that's ideally what the whole thing should try and be. Yeah. It's not an easy process, though. But, uh, but yes, by looking at the great works, you are uh, simultaneously slightly crushed and slightly elevated by seeing it. Um. That's, yeah, I, and I wonder too, like, um, you know, they talk about DNA studies and like how much DNA is similar to a, to ancestors, like you know, a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago. Um, if we're if Ozymandias is like from two thousand to three thousand BC, mm. uh, uh, he's he like one of the pharaohs, right? Um, I'm not sure which one. Yeah, he is of the noble line, I believe. He, yeah, he's one of those ancient Egyptian pharaohs pretty sure that like if you go that far back in humanity everybody is related to everybody so we are descendants of Ozymandias that particular king unless he we was shared one of those no, we, or something. we share genes in common with him at least even if yeah. it, even if we're not directly related to him if you do go back far enough apparently there was a period in time when there was only about 2000 humans so yeah we are we're closely related in that sense yeah, yeah. Which is hard to think of, you know, just only 2,000 humans on Earth when we're sitting around with 7 billion. Um, well, it's, and now the 2,000 humans, I've also been like. That's an estimate, of course. Yeah. Other um, sources that, that say at that time also it wasn't just the one species either of humans. There would have been. Human related uh, things like just. Homo. Mm-hmm. Or, is that what they're called? Yeah, Homo. Uh, n- well, or yes. Even the before that, they might have been. We'll just call them hominids in the whole area. Hominids, yes, yeah. cousins to humanity, yeah. if not, we'll say uh, you know uh, evolutionary brothers and sisters, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I I don't know how like well yeah two thousand is good enough for an estimate anyway. It's a breeding population that manages mm-hmm. to build itself up to seven billion, so not too much to complain about there. Yeah, that's cool, and it's and it's weird too how like we're so. At 7 billion, we're so homogeneous, too. We're so, like, uniform as a species. Well, um, especially compared to the other species out there. Like, you take a look at chimpanzees. Um, they have apparently have, like, 16 times just the basic variation on on various uh, things, like how the ear f- lobes go, how the eye things, uh, you know, work out as. Yeah, yeah. Because we're a new species. We, uh, we eventually may have blue and green hair like they show in all the anime, but... It's going to have to evolve naturally unless somebody lets down their uh, <coughs> legal guard and we put that in. Just slip it in when no one's looking. What, you mean genetically modify people to have green hair? We can do it. That's not difficult. <laughs> we can do blue hair too, but the trick would have to be getting the nice color blue, not the weird kind of faded blue you get with like bad dye jobs. Well, you know what color I think would be cool? Because like, I've read about like iridescence in insects and birds and stuff. Oh, yes, but that tends to be a little hard because with uh, stuff like birds, the iridescence uh, is, is something even the bird can't naturally create. They have to eat the right foods to come up with that. And that they have to replace their feathers as the iridescence loses out of it. Oh, that'd be awesome. So if I eat a certain kind of blueberry, I could have like iridescent blueberry skin? Skin, hair, anything like that, yes. Uh, but uh, Wasn't there an X-Men character who had skin like that? Probably a few of them by now, right. yes. But uh, the thing is, is that if it was something like hair, the more you wash it, the quicker it would lose its iridescence. If the longer you keep your hair, the more it would lose its iridescence. So an iridescent hairstyle would really only work with people that go for uh, short, like uh, Fantastic Sam or Pixie haircut styles. Hmm. Well, that's kind of fine with me. I like those, so... <laughs> it, well, it doesn't work with everybody, but yeah. it's a it's a decent established haircut for both. Okay. So, yeah, watch, watch for that new fashion coming 2013. Maybe, maybe not. It would yeah. be nice to get some more uh, variation in the eye colors. Eye color variation... Well, I mean, like the nonsense evolution uh, area things that uh, wind up popping up, I think, wouldn't be uh, be uh, punishable too badly. I think 
Not that I want to be the person who doesn't have to face trial for tampering with the human, you know, genetic uh, code. Is there laws against that? There are a lot of laws in a lot of countries about that. So you could, like, go to jail for being an evil scientist? Yes, you could. For adding green hair to the human collective genome. And, and they would put you in, like, a, a entirely glass... Uh, sell. <laughs> probably not. You'd probably just get some sort of minimum security prison because there's not a good chance you would wind up putting more things into the human genome when nobody's looking because you don't have a lab anymore. Oh, minimum security, huh? In Canada, too. Uh, not bad. That actually... You know, I think, I'm, I'm, I think I'll go for that. You know, actually, until not too long ago, you could get arrested for importing a uh, fish from China that glows in the dark. Oh, yeah. Um... It was just uh, one of those things that uh, they said, because this fish is genetically modified, it you can't have it in Canada. Despite the fact such a fish, if it got out in the wild, is not going to survive. You can bet an owl is going to see that glow-in-the-dark fish night one. Yeah, so so the, the rule against it is partly... Well, it's partly as, you know, this blanket protection against invasive species, but it's also partly just being afraid of stuff that they don't know about. Well, it, it was one of the things that they realized, we don't know what people are going to do with this. Let's just come up with a blanket law and work it from there. Which, admittedly, I think is possibly the smartest thing they could have done with, because when you look conversely at what they've tried to do with, like, internet regulatory laws, it's horribly after the fact. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, coming up with a nice genetic pre-blanket law to make sure, it, and then you can start, you know putting your little niches here and there to make it work. Because so, now you can get these glow-in-the-dark fish in. Okay. They've, okay. they've come up with a law that says, yeah, these fish are never going to wind up spoiling the natural population. They're not going to catch on. So, okay. Import them. Have fun. Well, yeah, I, I guess I can get behind that. I can get behind, um, yeah, prohibiting the things that we don't... Well, I mean, it sounds like so much uh, superstition and like fear of science but I guess there is a place for um, what you would call it like you know prudence and well it's just one of the things that once it gets awesome. out it's so hard to, to cull I mean just look at uh, our, our attempts to, to get the purple loose strife under control we spent decades trying to pull them out trying to get this done trying to get them out of the, like, the, the ditches and the culverts on the sides of the rows because they're an invasive plant species they look nice invasive Horribly uh, hard to get rid of. There's no natural predators for it. Mm. Um, only to find out, no, actually, you know what? They are one of these, like, uh, just, you know, recent disturbing event invaders that once the soil is, is nice and packed down again, they don't. They wind up being outcompeted by the natural stuff. So every time we went, we were pulling them out by the roots, we were tearing up the soil, making it good for them to grow back again. Okay, so let's just step back to it. Yes. Because that's a cool name, purple loose strife. Yes. Um, is that like, is that what we know as fireweed? Is that what yes, that? it's the it's really tall. Okay, here in, in North America, it's really tall. If you're listening from Europe, mm -hmm. it's actually fairly short because you do have natural predators. We have opted not to bring those predators into our ecology just because we don't know what they'll do with all the other plants and, and, and how they'll interact with the other species. I'm trying to think of like a European animal that we don't have over here. I'm not thinking of Well, that's, that's the thing is, uh, in many cases, it's even small things. Like, uh, just subgroups can cause so much havoc. So, so by predator, you might just be talking about like a beetle or something. Yes, it's a, it's a small bug that effectively preys and prevents the, the fireweed or purple loosestrap from growing so tall. It becomes a, uh, just a just another little weed off the side. But it was brought over because some people said it would look great in the garden and they grow so tall here in North America. <laughs> and then they got out. But yeah, every time we were pulling it up out of there, we were disturbing the soil. There it's soil disturbance, you know, in invasive species. Which is why we kept seeing them along the culverts and ditches on the side of the road. Because we keep cleaning those out year after year. There's high disturbance turned over. The reason they were in the swamp area was because the moose keep, uh, you know, digging up the area. If you just let it sit down for a while, they get out-competed naturally. We spent so much time, so much effort on something we really didn't need to work on. Oh, well, uh, there you go. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. So, so, yeah, with, with the whole invasive species thing, and once you get it in, it's so almost impossible to get rid of it. Yeah, uh, okay. And, heck, we have... 
it, we are a good killing species. We are a, just, in the terms of other species on the earth, we are just an amazingly alpha predator species. Uh-huh. But even we have a hard time completely eradicating something like a plant from the, the any environment. I guess so. Plants, yeah, plants. Like I can. Well, a specific plant. If we need to, you know, wipe the earth bare, we can do that. I can. I can see humans um, having a huge impact on something, um, you know, like a large animal that has to live somewhere, like a. Um, a, a what am I thinking? Uh, the passenger <laughs> pigeon. Well, we can we can work with trees. bison because they're they're yeah. a notorious example. Yeah, bison. They need a large territory. Yes. Um, and they're very like they have to you know have to they have to be out and about. And they taste so good. And they taste good. Um, <laughs> they're twice as tasty as beef. It's amazing. Uh, and yes, we have uh, bison farms in BC, so that's cool. Well, we kind of need bison farms. We destroyed the wild population. Uh, yeah, I, I think they they have introduced new wild populations in like places like Montana, right? Yes, uh, transplanting the, the whole thing. That's not a very good way of doing it, though. Um, most transplanting of, of, of animals has a huge, like, 80% mortality rate. It's better if you can ship an entire herd of creatures over. You get better odds then, but it's still a very high mortality. So um, okay. it's one of their their less uh, desired ways to go about it. And it winds up being like fifty thousand uh, dollars per successful creature transplant. It's horrible. Um, I just picture like human beings as being like kind of like a rat on top of a zamboni. Like um, mm. the rat can reach all the controls of the zamboni. So like you know humans can like cause an incredible amount of damage on the earth. Um, but in the end, you know, the human is just that rat sitting on top of the zamboni. Like, you know. This is how I picture humans. Uh, you, you know the predators from Predator? Uh, yeah. We are like that to other species. That's how they perceive humanity. We have these weird abilities. We're crazy good at killing things. Well, it's I, scary, <laughs> man. It's, it's Yeah, I like that the thought that, you know, humans are dominant and humans can control nature. But you We're know, a mega I, predator. It's like, you know, we're just a little, like, you know, a little creature. Like, imagine a giant, like, ball uh, and, and a, like, a little, like, hamster at the very top of this, like, tiny little hamster at the top of this giant ball, and the hamster walking back and forth co- makes the ball roll around. Like, that's... And the ball squishes some creatures and causes other creatures to... Okay, I, I okay, okay. No, no, no. How about, how about I, I refine this? Is it's not just one hamster in a ball; it's a giant ball filled of, with hamster balls, and ha- their combined movements causes the ball as a the larger sphere as a whole to move. Because uh, yeah. you and I are small one person things; we can accomplish good things, but we can only accomplish so much because we are inherently one individual apiece. Uh, yeah. But it's again humanity. Speak for yourself. <laughs> it's humanity as a whole, though, that causes these big things to happen. That's why you can feel ennobled by seeing the Hoover Dam, because it's the work of a whole bunch of people who have come together to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I a human is not much of a threat. Humanity will scare you pantsless, mm-hmm. and that's why we're the only species with pants. Um, well, I wouldn't want to get in the way of the progress of humanity. Although, um, I guess there's some there's something to be said for things happening in BC, northern BC right now. Uh, where they're they're talking about giant pipelines and stuff. And like, oh yes. You know, is that kind of progress? Is that inevitable? Is that just going to roll over our province? Or I mean, I kind of I kind of think that there should be pipelines, but on the other hand, I there's no like the organizations I don't trust. Yeah, I do not trust those organizations. Also, I'd like it better if they refined the darn stuff before shipping it, because it's a lot easier to clean up the refined product than it is the crude. Hmm. Yeah. Um. Even if, you know, it means just setting fire to the stuff and then, you know, because with the, the refined stuff, it just burns away a, l- a lot cleaner and a lot more completely as opposed to the crude, which has gunk, which will sit for another 20, 30 years before slowly working its way through the environment. Uh, yeah, okay. So, but that's a little political. Let's not get too deep into that subject. There's, I think there's okay. some areas we, we would have to uh, be very carefully treading. Okay, we can do politics another time, or, or not at all. Well, it's just one of those things that, that you can wind up accidentally putting your foot into in, in your mouth and wind up coming out looking like uh, just some big know-nothing who likes to spout hot air. 
Hmm. Okay. Especially if you know you're trying to talk sensibly to somebody who is on the other side of the debate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So well, I, it, I, I, I don't see too many people like you know average Joes around. They, or a they, pro pipeline. Or a pro pipeline, at least. Yeah, not in my day-to-day interaction. Well, that's because we're in B.C. If we talk to the people in Alberta, we might get a whole different view. And I would like to have some Alberta listeners. They are great people. Um, I like their cities. Oh, and their yeah. their road layout is so nice and flat. It's wonderful. <laughs> so kudos to you, Alberta, for being flat. <laughs> well, for having a very nice linear road system, you can see traffic problems happening like like a couple kilometers before you interact with it. Which is always nice. There's something to be said about being able to see where you're going before you're there. So do you hear that BC government get on this? <laughs> Especially the BC government here here in Victoria. I just cannot love the road system here. I, I can tolerate it, but I cannot love it. So many blind corners as you're going over hills and turning, and, and all of a sudden you split the road off. Oh, well, yeah, that's your neighborhood. <laughs> it's meant for... Buggies and carts, it seems like. Anything that have like an internal combustion engine just moves too fast to appreciate the meandering style. Well, wouldn't you rather have a buggy and cart? Uh, if I could keep the horse properly fed, I could dig it. <laughs> yeah, there. There you go. Problem solved. They, they actually they do have, you know, downtown Victoria, as, as anybody uh, will uh, know if they've been downtown. They have horses and drawing carriages. And they treat the horses very nicely for those of you who who are very uh, animal sensitive. Oh well, that's good to know. Do they like? I never tried, but will they let you pet the horses? If um, if the horse is feeling okay at the time. Uh, as with any creature, sometimes an abundance of strangers makes them a little skittish. They are well trained, so you can get them to go along the path even when they're skittish. Might not be best to touch the horse. If it's a nice calm day, the weather's doing good, the horse is looking okay and calm. Yeah, go ahead, pet the horse. Yeah, well, I guess the thing to do is just ask the uh, the person who's yes. controlling the horse, and they'll tell you. Um, Always ask first, though, <laughs> especially when it comes to a big creature like a horse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a- anybody who's been on a farm will tell you. I mean, horses, like humans, are you know, but there's a point where they start getting frightened by things, and those hooves can really hurt you. To say nothing of their bite. And they got filthy mouths, so you don't. You actually kind of prefer a little bit of the hoof as opposed to the mouth. <laughs> that sounded dirty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I guess if, uh, upon reflection, it did. Uh, okay, so right, but yes, should we change the subject? Yes, yes. Let's go on to the main question for the, for today. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, it occurred to me as I was uh, as I was going about my daily activities the other day. Um, does a system of of rules inherently limit the mind? Like, uh, okay, let's figure this way. You and I are both well versed in D and D. Yeah. So when we're thinking tactics for, oh no, things are starting to get you know nasty here. We're kind of low on hit points, low on spells. What do we do to get out of this alive? We start thinking tactically minded. Yeah. But we've also experienced people who have had their first time in D and D, and they come up with tactics and strategies that are just so completely outside of the proverbial box that. Uh, that, that is something you and I would not have thought of. They are not thinking along the system of the rules. They are not limited. And whereas you and I would be, even unconsciously. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, I throw my backpack at it. What? How do you do? You throw your backpack? Like, what kind of action is that? <laughs> uh, f- let's say make that an attack thing. 10 foot range, maybe, maybe uh, yeah, we'll give it, a, we'll be generous, say 10 foot range increment. See, we can work out the rules for it, but would we have thought of it? No, because we tend to just abstract it out into that uh, these objects or stuff we have, we don't imagine the backpack anymore. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and then the player's like, well, because there's trail rations in there, obviously the bear would go after my trail rations. And then meanwhile, the DM's like, um, he's actually already chasing you, so <laughs> I guess he ignores the trail rations. Yes, again, that, that is the downside to potentially having a DM that knows animal behavior. So if, if you are DMing, if you're playing under my DM shield, that, that won't work. Neither will climbing a tree, by the way. <laughs> oh, great. Um, hopefully you're high enough level for, you know, like a fly spell. Yeah, that'll do it. Although... Although a flying bear. <laughs> 
Yes, they do have a winged template I do like applying every once in a while. Uh, I do prefer pu- putting that on bison, though. Is that way you get buffalo wings? Oh, buffalo wings. Can you imagine, like, a flying bear being, like, more like a flying squirrel? like Just with a big flap of skin, just, you know, <laughs> climbs up the tree and then just kind of does, like, a 15-yard pounce down on you? Exactly. There you go. Congratulations. You've created the grizzly flying squirrel. The flying grizzly... The grizzly flying squirrel? Flying grizzly squirrel? <laughs> Well, okay, we'll just call it the uh, the gliding grizzly. Because then you get the, the GG and the gliding, repetition. Yeah. It's gliding grizzly and his adventures with the other animals. <laughs> See, the only downside with that, though, is that uh, uh, squirrels can like work kind of together sometimes. Bears are highly individual. So mm-hmm. if we could come up with a species that does the gliding thing, then you're walking through the forest and you hear something up in the trees and you're just catching glimpses of them as they're going just bit by bit and you don't know what they are, but they're moving up there. Oh, They're moving into position. Oh. That is frightening, especially like if it's twilight. Oh, yes, yes, it's just dark enough that you see the movement, but you, you maybe a form, maybe wolves, gliding wolves. Gliding wolves. No, I actually already applied wings to them. Yes, I had a nice creature for that. No, been there, done that. Yes, yeah, flying wolves. <laughs> So yes, I've, well, I've created <laughs> flying wolves. They had wings and all that. Well, it was something something for uh, more smaller creatures and players to, to ride on. Because, dude, a griffin is huge when you're a small character. They're, they're massive and maybe scary. Get yeah. yourself a flying wolf. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think I've seen fantasy art of wolves with wings. I think I've seen that done. I gave them uh, raven wings simply because people seem to really c- say, I connect with this animal. This is me in my spirit form. So I said, well, you know, everyone's, you know, spirit animals got with ravens and wolves. I'll put them together. Now you can say it's just one spirit animal. It's this thing. Uh, do you have a name for it? What I did. I made it up. Uh, I took the, I took some of the old names for it, like Bran for the name. Of, okay. of the so it's, it's so, okay. yeah. Bran or, well, something like that. It's in my uh, my warehouse of ideas I've come up with. In your warehouse. <laughs> um, yes. Hey, Joe, I got some good things in my warehouse just to spook out the players. Some nice low-level things, too. You don't have to be level 15 before you start seeing the good stuff. Oh, well, but that's good to hear. <laughs> yes, my necromantic rooster will scare a second-level party. Just, wah! Um, so I guess, we're th- I guess thinking outside the box basically leads us to interesting places. Oh, yes. and But here's but, uh, that's the thing. is, is uh, it's, When you get more familiar with the system, you start unconsciously, I believe, working within the system by default. And, and uh, I wonder, is there a way around this? Uh, there, there must be. But, th- I mean, I guess you have to just pick a different strategy all the time. Like, always be changing it up. Um, or maybe mixing up, yeah, mixing up what game you're playing. Uh, we're doing D&D this time when we're done with this campaign. We'll come back to them later, but for the next one... We'll work on uh, Shadowrun. Congratulations, now you guys have guns. Yeah. And you start working things differently. Well, I always found that that, um, that transition a little bit jarring because like the vast majority of my gaming was with D&D. And then mm. when I switch to something like Shadowrun, it just it just feels off. And I always, like, I, I, I know it's wrong to do this, but I always say, oh, that rule, like, would have been way better if they just did it like D&D. It's like, oh, this would have been way better if it was D&D. So... Oh, well, what if we go to something a little bit more way out? What if we go with like a uh, GURPS or, or like the TriStat system, where you can effectively be anything, and it covers under the one set of rules, modular rules too, so you can take them in and take them out as you need be. Well, yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm willing to try it out. Um, I guess provided somebody else has paid the sixty dollars for the supplements you need first. Um, yeah, if it's one of those, yeah, I mean, all of TriStat has that free PDF going for it. That is nice. That, that didn't help save it in the long run. It's an obscure system, but uh, I, I like including it in just because it is free. So that way, if you get intrigued by it, you can find it, and you don't have to pay the money to find out whether or not you like it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think at least more systems should have a sample system that way. You know, like, like hey, try our sample D and D, see if it's you. Um, but yeah, I guess if you play like if you play the same game for like too long, it's easy to get stagnated. You really should switch it up, probably just just to see what to, what else is out there and how else you know people solve problems. Um, I wonder if like with our game designer culture, because it is it's fairly small, mm-hmm. and basically like the people who are really good have basically have tried all of what's out there. So I wonder if there is even w- there's a, a bigger echo chamber um, between all these games. 
Um, well, there is. I remember... Um, okay, uh, tr- uh, the Shadowrun system uses dice pools, but they're not the first person to do so. That was actually the... What was it? Buffalo Head Games uh, version of uh, the Ghostbusters role-playing game. Okay. It is out there. I would love to get a copy, but it's been out of print for so long. The price is going to be through the roof. Okay. Uh, say la vie. But they were the first one to come up with the whole thing. Did they use it quite as well as what Shadowrun did? I've been told not exactly. Huh. Yeah. But uh, so uh, I think over time we wind up getting this thing where, uh, where you come up with something new, another person refines it, and it cycles through... And uh, maybe we're all working together to help come up with the best possible one system that everyone could be uh, happy with. Well, I, I kind of... Like, that that's my vision of D&D. I know that could be wrong. It could be quite wrong. And I know some people will definitely disagree with me. But I kind of think that I, I wish that D&D could be that because it's like, you know, D20 system. It's like, you know, kind of the... It can be universal, like GURPS tried to be, but... Didn't seem to work. Their rules were slightly more uh, basically complex. Is okay. the, uh, whereas uh, you could tell with uh, 3.0, 3.5 D&D especially, they made sure to come up with a simple, basic core mechanic everyone could get their heads around and then work it from there. And from what it seems with the D&D Next, they're really bringing that one home too. So kudos to the developers out there who are making sure to come up with a simple, basic system everybody can understand quickly and easily. Yeah, yeah, that's good. And I guess, I mean, it could have just, like, at the beginning of 3.0, they could have just as easily made the core mechanic, you flip a coin and add modifiers or something like that. Yes. Um, but I guess the the idea of the D20, was, that was iconic, that shape, that, that thing that you can hold in your hand is iconic to the game of D&D. Well, it's not just iconic to the game of D&D. Remember that uh, the uh, Romans and Egyptians themselves had die 20s. Uh, yes, they certainly did. That's that's true. Yeah. So it, it seems to be, you know, at least transcendent beyond the game itself. Um, what they were, what the Romans and Egyptians were doing with the die twenties was very much not likely playing, you know, negative three hundred edition D and D. I think they used them for divination, or like they basically said that the gods controlled the results, something like that. Or gambling. Well, never discount gambling. <laughs> it could have been gambling, yeah. Um, uh, and when when did gambling? It must have. When did when did the conflict between gambling and the church first start? Like what, that would have been before there was a Christian church, right? Oh yes, uh, f- probably pretty far back in the uh, the Hebrew church, if nothing else. So that po- tosses you back five thousand years, because okay. it is like uh, the year fifty five hundred according to the uh, the Hebrew calendar. Uh, sure, but but my question, like, was so, um, did is. Uh, because I don't know my Bible too well. You might not know it much better than I do, but I don't remember prohibitions against gambling in the Old Testament. Uh, I think it was always prohibitions against excessive gambling. It was. Uh, they never said it, you know, but it's it's what they use for the BC term here. Know your limit. Play within it. Oh yeah. Okay. So that's from like uh, <laughs> Book of uh, Numbers or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> that's from the, the BC Lottery Commission. Actually, is what they use. It's you know, catchy that way. They can say it every time they talk about gambling. Just quickly at the end. Oh, your limit. Play within it. Done. Yeah, yeah. So they can... They, uh, what's that called? Uh, washing your hands or... Uh, yeah. yeah. Absolving themselves. Um, but I just... You know, it just occurred to me. The Book of Numbers has... The, like, like the, That's the best name ever for a book. But it's like... It's not cool. Like, you know, numbers. You think it's all oh, like, you know, math and prime numbers and cool stuff like that. But yeah, no, it's not that... <laughs> Well, there's that, that's why we have terms like adjectives. You can go with the book of transcendent numbers. The book of non-real numbers. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, it sounds like something you're not supposed to read. What, what's that book that they publish random numbers? I oh, yes. One million anymore. random numbers mm-hmm. with 100,000 standard deviations. Ah, uh, yeah. If you can, go to Amazon, find that one, and read the reviews. The reviews are just spectacular. One star review. I thought this book was supposed to be random numbers. I got a second copy and looked. It's the same thing written on every page. (laughs) I like the numbers. They were random, except for the small numbers written in the lower corner of the page, in which case I noticed every time I flipped, they increased sequentially. (laughs) So so definitely you can tell what what happens when you're a math major with a little spare time on your hands. Um... Okay, still talking about about the limitations of rules. I was gonna like bring up a point about like 
imagine a, like it like take away a rule, take away another rule, like take away rule after rule. Like eventually, there's no more role playing game. But now, like you have the rules of language still and the rules of thought. So take away those rules. Basically, you do. You end up with like your role playing game. Instead of being a role playing game, it's just a list of random numbers. Ah. So the first person to reach the random number nine wins. Well, that, Go. Would, that would be a rule. <laughs> Interesting. So you, yeah. There, okay, so then there clearly has to be some sort of rule for it to be a game. Otherwise, you might as well just read the random numbers. Uh, exactly, yeah. Ah. So, so there is some inherent limitation in the game system itself. Well, in the fact that yeah, you because it is a game and a system. Game and a system. You're putting it in a book or or in a PDF document or something. Yeah. Ah. Or just you know reading the binary version of some other PDF. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of taking it to extremes. So yes. yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I like to take things to extreme just to, to see where we go. Well, I, I think that's a great way of, of seeing how, how a system breaks down. You start putting as much stress as you can by making it go to this extreme, and then you see how it, how it deals with it. If it can handle the extreme, congratulations. You've got yourself a good system. I, I, I like to imagine, like, you know, a DM sitting at the table, and he's like, okay, group, I've decided to go with the ultimate free-form role-playing. There are no rules. For the rest of the night... We will yell random numbers at each other. <laughs> oh, but then you'll get the one person in the corner saying, Ah, but the human mind is not set up for true randomness. We will not be able to yell out random numbers. Your game has been defeated. <gasps> <laughs> then what? Do they win or lose the game, technically? If you kill the DM, you have to become the DM. That's the rule. <laughs> so that's how, that's how you secretly get somebody else to take up the shield, and you wind up being a player, eh? <laughs> yeah. I'll remember that for the future. That sounds like a good tactic. Um, okay, well, let's work this on, on something that technically doesn't have any rules, because we are the simulationists. We work with fiction of all kinds. That's right. Okay. And it is Novel Writing Month. So what about novels? Technically, when you're writing something, there isn't a system of, of the rules in there, in the same way that playing a D&D game has a system of rules. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. I mean, there are rules of language. Of course. And hopefully rules of language and punctuation and all that, grammar. Well, I, I, I've i grown more lenient over the years. Like, I, when I was a student, I, I was very um, particular about people's spelling and grammar and things like that, but... Yeah, now... Remember, punctuation can turn the, uh, a huge difference on a sentence like, man, love is cool. If you take out the comma from there, man, love is cool. Yeah, but, but to me... It like, really I, changes the uh, when someone reads it. And to me, that's delightful and enjoyable. I guess maybe it's not supposed to be, but I, I'm of this chaotic mindset that I prefer a little bit of ambiguity and a little bit of, like, um, chaos, basically, yeah. Ah, whereas, whereas I am a slightly more law inclined, and I do love the system of rules where you can set the whole thing up so that it is, in some sense, even mathematically unambiguous, yeah. which is why I like the Oxford comma. Um, I, I guess yeah. well, I, I I use the Oxford comma myself. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, I use it myself, um, and I just like you know I feel for you because I I fear that. In your quest, well, I'm, I'm sure you won't become like uh, dogmatic or fanatical about a quest for lawfulness. But in your quest for disambiguity, I fear that you will go in circles. You'll ultimately uh, come to nothing because um, it is very hard to nail down absolute certain meaning. Um, and but when you're using yeah. something with like the uh, Oxford commas, you can effectively split the sentence up into uh, you know three sub sentences that you've combined. Uh, I wish to dedicate this book to my parents. I wish to dedicate this book to Joan of Arc. I wish to dedicate this book to God. So when you're assembling that into one combined sentence, you want to make sure the comma's in there so you don't want to dedicate it to your parents, Joan of Arc and God. In which case you're stating your parents are Joan of Arc and God without the comma. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean... and But that's, again, that's where um, you require a context of, you know, learning and, like, you have to have learned the language and learned some conventions because that construction of um, following up one set of, like, my parents, mm-hmm. comma, Joan of Arc and God, that convention is is a convention. It's not 
necessarily present. It doesn't work the same way in all languages. Um, so I, uh, what am I trying to say? So the fact that that can be construed that way, um, it doesn't mean it has to be. It doesn't mean it... No, no, and most people will read that normally. I wish to dedicate this book to my parents, Joan of Arc, and God. Yeah. But it can be seen as ambiguous, which, if I may go on a slight tangent, is why in mathematics, once you get past, we'll say, grade four or five or so, they try and get you away from using that dividers, uh, divisor sign. They just do it in, in like fractional representation because then things start getting weird, like uh, it, how are you supposed to apply this? Are the two terms used this way or the other way? Yeah, Which is why occasionally when you go online they say, hey, what is this equal? And you see half the people get it wrong. It's because most of the time there's a division sign in there and that messes up some people's heads. Also, they don't know the whole uh, proper sequence of, of using uh, mathematics, you know, brackets, exponents. Uh, yeah, so order forth. of operations. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, and like, th- I like this because um, it, it's uh, basically, I guess it's interesting to me because you can go down, you like, you can have a statement that's a little bit ambiguous, and you can carry that statement to both, like, of two possible logical conclusions. And um, once you reach, you you won't know the actual meaning of the statement until you reach both conclusions and compare them and decide which one is more likely. I do like it when you can create an ambiguous sentence for the purposes of creating an ambiguous sentence to make things work out in various odd styles. Don't get me wrong, I do like that. So that if you did want to set up, or somebody mentions their parents, Joan of Arc and God, maybe it turns out they do believe that is who their parents are. But you keep this as a question as you go throughout, and then to a, a, a very adroit reader who is paying attention to this and knows of it, they can follow like the maybe hidden jokes written within. Uh, so, yeah. so there is something to be said about that. Yeah. I am not hard line on, on, on the whole sentence structure, but you, if you're going to do it that way, it does require a little bit of extra effort, and most people don't have that within them. I, I, guess, I guess so, yeah. And, well... The other thing is, um, I think I can sympathize with your kind of with your your fear of this great chaos of envy, like because there is this kind of branching chaos that can happen if you you know if you encounter one fork in the road, mm-hmm. where you, you basically you have to keep both paths in your mind because it could be either one. But then if there's an, another fork, then you have to keep now you have three paths in your mind or four or f- so on, and if they keep on Branching, dichotomously branching then out. Yes. You ultimately you will not be able to process uh, what's going on in the story unless you're very carefully, like mentally, yeah, uh, mentally plotting every possible ways. outcome as you go. Yeah. Which don't get me wrong, if an author can pull that off, that is a masterstroke of superb writing. But as I said, most people either don't have it within them or just don't care enough to do so. So there is that. But yes, okay. Sorry, this is a being a tangent our, ourselves here, going well, off on our branch. That too like abstract people. <laughs> but yes, um, with that in place, you know, like the whole system of, you know, I am trying to communicate to you, so there has to be those rules. Okay, okay. And author <laughs> writing doesn't uh, have the same set of rules I- inherent to like a system as the game does. So you could even be writing about like a pseudo medieval s- style campaign situation that takes place in the Forgotten Realms and not have to worry about, uh, you know, okay, did he, you know, roll a natural one on his attack check here? Yeah. That's not in place. But uh, (coughs) then again, you do get uh, people who write and have what's called a hard fiction. When they write a stuff... There is a sense of rules in there. Is it are you like when you use the word hard fiction? Is that analogous to hard science fiction? That kind of well, it's it's interesting because some people use it as hard fiction in that everything they write about is technically accurate, whereas some people write it as what I write about has its own internal uh, system. Like, um, oh, we'll go with the Harry Potter series. Magic has its own system of rules. Sure. And you can't cross the system and, and just say, oh, no, I magicked, I out magic this magic. Now I can go against the rule. Mm-hmm. Although I do believe there's an, a, a plot line about that. I haven't read the final book. No one spoil it for me. <laughs> I still got to get a hold of the movies, dang it. I want to see the movies before I read the books, because I've been told if you read the books, then the movies aren't so great. 
Mm. Okay. So I'll do it for maximum awesomeness. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a system. Although it's not working out quite great right now. Whatever. But uh, yes, uh, and so that's termed on its own a hard fiction. You know, because the, the rules, it's magic, yes, but the, there are rules to it, and those are hard-coded in there. Yeah, sure. And that's what I'm talking about, really. Um, another good example is the uh, Ghost in the Shell series. They're talking about doing stuff like moving brains around and, and dealing with cyber stuff. And, but all that has its own rules. It doesn't feel like it's abstract, like the author's just, oh, I'm pulling this out, and haha, now this applies, and this is why they can't just take the simple route and shoot the guy in the head, done. End of the mission. Five minutes, done. Let's go home, get some beer. So I think there's something to be said, and that gets a lot of good praise when someone can write a, a thing that uh, so that once the reader gets a hold of it, and starts consciously or unconsciously learning the system that are the rules that are in place there, they can work out why the the characters are doing things as they are. Okay. Why didn't he just you know like teleport in you know nuke him with a fireball teleport out? Well, you know, actually, there's a system of rules going on that prevents that sort of thing. And if you'd read the previous four books, you'd have known it by now. <laughs> uh, and and I, I like that because there's endless uh, arguments on the internet about why. Uh, Gandalf didn't just have the eagles carry Frodo into the Mount Doom. The eagles were not his pets. They were their own intelligent creatures, and they knew enough to keep away from the ring. And there are some other arguments, too, about like several thousand hungry orcs with ranged weapons versus yeah. eagles that happen to have giant drumsticks. Mm, drumsticks. Yeah, e- and eagles can't fly forever. Yes. They have to land. Which is why... He should have called in the giant albatrosses. They could have just flown for months. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but sadly, Gandalf doesn't know about the giant albatrosses. Yeah. I've never heard him talk about them. <laughs> okay. um, just start bringing this in. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so as uh, the whole system of rules, I, I think it, it seems to exist even in good writing for authors who technically don't have a system or don't technically need it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I guess it, it seems to be something that readers kind of demand is a sense of internal consistency. And there seems to be, like, actual rules to storytelling because um, if you tell an unsatisfactory story, readers will be angry with you. And, as, you know, that can be something as simple as uh, the deus ex machina, or ass pull, as they call it now, where all of a sudden, hey, here's your solution, we're all done. Um... Read the end of the Twilight series, apparently, if you want a really good, bad example of that. Okay, I haven't got to... Yeah, I've got through the first book. I have been told the the final movie is just amazingly entertaining. Not good, but <laughs> very entertaining. Well, I go to the theater to be entertained. So there you go. <laughs> so, you know, there is that. But yes, apparently there is a deus ex machina, or ass pull ending. Yeah, and, and the, the reason... Yeah, the reason why... Uh, Deus Ex Machina is, is unsatisfactory to readers is often because when you begin you begin a story you don't necessarily say lo and behold listeners gather around as I tell a tale which I promise uh, will fit together from beginning to end and has some sort of cohesive meaning throughout and I'm not just going to make up a quick ending because hey supper time and there and and why I choose to tell you this tale rather than the one I told you last week or a different tale. Um, beca- like, you know, why do we even choose the stories that we we, know, well, that we tell? Like, if you're writing a novel, why did you pick that subject to write it about? Uh. Um, and then, so yeah, if there's a deus ex machina, it's like, well, you could have just saved us a whole novel by saying, you know... You know, or telling the other guy's story. I mean, this yeah. guy, you know, who who wound up wrapping everything up in five minutes once he got on the scene, why aren't we watching him all the time? Yeah, like, he's way better. <laughs> I had to read a whole novel of this other guy who didn't know a dang thing, and I had to follow this wet-nosed pup around for 400 pages. Yeah. Why couldn't I have been following Mr. Awesome? Yeah, and, and that's the other thing. Like, people, people expect characters to change in novels. So yeah, if you if you start off with somebody who's kind of weak and doesn't do a lot of things, you kind of you're rooting for them to improve and to become or at least alter, you know, something, you know, if if 
if the character doesn't change, why are you telling a story about them? What, like? Or actually, you know what I wouldn't mind is a the weak character who needs things explained to him or her is a good uh, way of of getting the readers in and knowing things. Yeah. So yeah, you know, okay, right. this is an important organization. Why does this person not know about it? Um, I don't know. They were they spent their entire life out in the middle of nowhere. So now they learn about it, and so you learn about it as well. But what I'd really like to see is just like a prologue chapter called The Tutorial, where you have this horrible, you know, know-nothing person, learns all this quick stuff, and then dies. <laughs> because they're stupid and ignorant, and then you go on to Mr. Awesome, and that's the real book. But now you know all the stuff and why it's important, and then you don't have to worry about them going through the whole darn thing, too. Well, that would be funny. I mean, yeah, unsatisfying in a normal novel, but if you do it for that effect, just for just for a nice, fa- you know, fake out prologue, man. <laughs> now you know what's going on in this setting. Let's dive into it with someone who's actually meaningfully competent in what they're to go, trying to do. Go. Yeah. I, I that must have been done before, but I mean, well, there's so many stories out there, so many novels. I'm. And but you so don't hear about it too much. If the if any listeners out there do know of it, please tell me. I would did get a chance to read that. Yeah, yeah. That would be nice. So, in the end, I think we've uh, established that uh, uh, the rules do seem to be inherent, uh, in, you know, in anything you do for fiction. There. Um, well, that's my opinion, and I, yeah, that's the way I feel about it. Um, I, I could, you know, it could be wrong, and that's the thing, like, if you find a way, <laughs> I'll, I'll create an aphorism here. If you find a way to break a rule, do it. <laughs> like, um, if you can, like... I, I'm not saying just, just don't follow the rules, but if you can figure out a way around, like, a, a well-established rule, um, you should go for that. It is a nice twist. It's like, oh, that can't be done! And it's like, ha, ah, I circumvented. Suck it. Yeah. Yeah, rather than just breaking it. But, yeah, I mean, of course, like, you know, have your justification for it and have, like, you know... Um, if if you're depriving readers of some um, uh, satisfaction in one area, the thing to do would be to you know put it in in another way. Like hmm. so, you, you know, you can break the rule, but if you provide that what the rule is giving it, by doing something else, then you can do that, and that'd be really, readers will enjoy that. I think. Well, it done correctly, they should enjoy it. Otherwise, they're yeah. an unreasonable reader. Yeah. And they should feel bad. Uh, and one of the be- okay, and we have also established though that one of the best ways to avoid uh, uh, from getting inherently limited to a, a system of rules, vary it up from time to time. Try this thing, try that thing. Even if you're gonna, just going to stick with your one setting, read books for other stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. well. Yeah. Expand sure. your mind, man. Yeah. And how do you um, like? How would you say? Okay, reading reading other like works probably the best way to to um, branch out and like keep yourself from being stuck in a rut um, what else like you can go for a walk that's a, that's a thing that yeah. live to life live life yes um, don't just like, travel through it go out there and live it go to another country uh, heck it could be as simple as just go camping yeah you a lot of people haven't spent a lot of time camping and so when the adventurers set up camp you know and why they need to rest a lot of people say, well, why do I have to stop after eight hours, man? I'm only going to sleep another eight hours. Why, like, why Why am I stopping? Have you walked for 16 hours with full gear on your back? <laughs> Even most soldiers don't do that or try to avoid it whenever possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so by actually going out and doing, uh, like, yeah. uh, going out and camping, you realize all the stuff that's entailed. You can't just sit down and all of a sudden, okay, now a camp has sprung up. Hooray! <laughs> Although, if you want to create a nice little level magic item, I think that's a nice thing to do. Oh, does that not exist? An instant camp? Uh, I recall a couple styles of it going in 2nd edition, but I really never saw anything devote itself for 3rd edition. Hmm. Um, there's the whole uh, s- uh, couple spells, but they take 10 minutes to cast a piece. If you could put that in just like a small magic item to pop out, and oh, hey, now you've got that cabin with 8 bunks. Well, I like how the... The spell takes as long to cast as it would just to set up the camp. It's like the wizard is like, you know, chanting furiously for ten minutes while the barbarian's like, "Yep, done." <laughs> yeah, but when he's done, the the wizard gets a cabin with a yeah. writing desk and, and like a fireplace and some bunks for like the hirelings. 
So when you know things start breaking up between the party, who do the hirelings go with? The guy who is sleeping in one small pup tent, or the guy that produces a cabin every night? I don't know. If the barbarian can manage to get a hold of the wizard's spellbook and burn it... Well, that's why you make it a magic item, so you can do it once a day. <laughs> so, there you go. But, uh... Yeah, it would be a nice... I think I could qualify as a cheap magic item, because it really doesn't provide any combat benefit. It's just something that helps save you time. Uh, oh, and uh, let's see. Back on the topic of expanding your horizons. Oh, yes. Um, I was going to... Well, I won't endorse or not endorse uh, substances, um, but there are... Thi- well, I mean, starting at your basic caffeine. Um, and the best way to do caffeine, like if you want to use it as an inspirational tool is if you are you don't use it regularly and you use it that one time because that's when it opens your mind. If it becomes a habit, it's just, you know, another part of your life. It becomes part of the background. <laughs> um, but when you try things like a new thing, like maybe it's caffeine, maybe it's uh, another drug of your choice, whether illegal or legal, um, that first... Or regionally legal. I mean, don't yeah. forget, there are two states that passed something recently. Oh, that's true, yeah. Um, so when yeah when you step into that new area that's often uh, very exciting. Um, the the I guess the thing to watch out for is you, you know don't turn it into a habit. Um, mm. I know that there are writers and creators out there who that's their that has become their habit. I'm, I'm thinking of Kevin Smith right now who he uh, he smokes his marijuana and then he that's his habit like his kind of routine every day smokes up, gets high, and then begins writing, which is cool. Like, it seems it seems to work for him. I think for his podcast, it also helps bring out the laughter a little easier. And let's face it, when Kevin Smith and all that, uh, you know, and, and Mosier and whoever else they have on there are laughing, it really does bring you into it, too. It's one of the few podcasts my wife actively tries to get me to listen to because after a long day, I can be tired, my feet can be just dead sore, sit down, put on the headphones, listen to Kevin Smith, and then I'll start laughing. Uh, if only we could be as funny and entertaining as him. Well, you know, I mean, he's done 200, you know, smodcasts. We're only on 11 yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. simulations. Yeah. So, And don't forget, he spent a good, you know, 10 years working on writing and building up this and becoming funny that way. Yeah, and, and he was, like, even from the, like, I've, of course, we know a lot about him, but from his podcast, but because he talks a lot about himself, but he was saying that even as a kid and as, in high school, he was already uh, writing and, and trying to be funny and, and doing that sort of thing. Which, I mean, that's that's cool. And, and like, if you look at kind of our experience, we've been doing like kind of the D&D thing and being creative that way since we were kids. Well, I do recall trying to be funny since I was a kid. I mean, <laughs> if you can get a good laughter out of one of your parents, you're, like, golden for that moment. Because mm-hmm. let's face it, humor doesn't really work that much between generations when someone's, like, in their 30s and you're, like, six. But if you can get a full-grown adult to laugh when you're a small kid, that's great. That's a huge sense of good thing. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah, you feel ten feet tall. Uh, was I making a point? Uh, uh, yes, we do not endorse, <laughs> or necessarily, uh, for that matter, on the other hand, uh, 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 naysay the use of substances. But we are uh, going to. We would be remiss if we didn't include them on the list of, of ways to expand your world. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. But uh, I do say we will condone that uh, they are used in a responsible setting. Uh, That's right, yeah. Just as, like, drinking alcohol is best not done alone in a darkened room. Oh, oops, I've been doing it wrong. (laughs) Yeah, you gotta go, it's it's a social thing. You go out with other people, you make sure you stay within your limit of tolerance, and, you know, you just have fun. Uh, Similarly, if you were going to do peyote, I would not recommend being anywhere near cliffs. Be somewhere nice where there's other people, hopefully completely sober people who can help you and you that you trust and do it in a, a nice, uh, relaxed setting. Uh, the last yeah, thing anybody wants is a good, bad right? hallucination trip. So yeah. we will at least give that out. That's what we will, you know, give thumbs up for. Responsible use of substances. Because, um, I mean, technically yeah. you can go really overboard on caffeine. I remember doing that in my university days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Cola Wars. And then afterwards, you get the whole if if I'm not drinking pop, I'm pretty much asleep sort of thing. So uh, yeah, that was irresponsible of me, and I have not done it since. 
Yeah, and and of course, yeah, the the thing that we're talking about is like having new experiences and and doing things that are not part of your routine. Um, so <laughs> that may be irresponsible in some cases, but um, but I don't know. Probably generally, like it's a good thing to. Yeah. Or well, you can you can switch things up. Or we'll move it to a safer thing. Donate some of your time. Volunteer. Volunteer for something going on in in your neighborhood. And that's yeah, that's a good that's a good point because you know everybody works like. Um, well, hopefully, <laughs> although statistically around here we're at what ninety two percent. We're still at eight percent unemployment or so. Um, yeah, we're at something. Oh no, wait, we're at about seven percent. So we're at ninety three percent of people work. Well. Let me let me try this. I think everybody has had a job at some point. Like even people who are unemployed, I think. I think they did something to earn a little everybody cash. Everybody has had a job, yeah. and um, you remember like starting a new job. That moment, that mm. um, <laughs> the sense of un- I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go in here, again. try and learn it all. Yes, again recently. Um, uh, so um, yeah, that experience in itself can be. Uh, can generate ideas and stuff. Um, and you can learn stuff about you you never knew. Like I didn't know I had customer you know interaction skills. <laughs> I got them laughing. I get them smiling at work now. Oh, that's good. That's it's a good, good feeling too. So you know, not only you know I, I can you do this, you can do it very well. Yeah. So yeah, and and so uh, so yeah, your point of volunteering brought that to my mind because with the volunteering. Um, often volunteering is kind of short term, and you do a thing for a little while, and then you you move on. Um, so you get a chance to have new experiences and like you know experience that. I, I, it, again, it's all about breaking the rules. So we're looking for ways to think outside the normal experience and um, bring ideas for you know whatever your fictional projects or your D and D project or whatever. So yeah, because let's face it, uh, a lot of the people who we regard as you know the big names in in the field of, of uh, the fiction, any fiction, are people that have gone out and lived. Uh, yeah, you know, n- not I don't could think of any one of them as just oh yeah he's that guy who lives in the basement all the time isn't he yeah. No, these are people that went out, did stuff, experienced life. So do so yourselves. Don't hesitate to do so, although do it constructively. Unless you get a job like doing deconstruction, then do it deconstructively. Deconstruction. Like it's basically demolition? the fir- it's demolition <laughs> uh, with a, a slightly uh, better name to it. Uh, or if you're doing renovations, the first thing you got to do is get rid of the old. So it's deconstruction, depending how you take the stuff down. I'm picturing. I have on my on my table here. I have um, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Of course, the that is not deconstruction. <laughs> okay, I guess it is a deconstruction of a topic, but it's not. You know, the firefighters aren't deconstructing. Well, sure they are. They're they're deconstructing books by burning them. Well, so that's the thing. But they're not unbinding them, not taking apart, and you know, and undoing what they've oh, done. Okay. They are effectively just destroying it. Sure. Toss it on the grill. It's done. Destruction. Okay, so, yeah. Yes. Uh, Hopefully that's given some good ideas to some people out there. Um, now let's make sure that nobody ever follows up on whether or not we do something similar. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's try and take our advice <laughs> yes. in the future. Uh, well, I mean, well, I mean, we're technically doing that this month with uh, trying to write novels and all that, or actively trying to sit down and write something instead of just whatever comes on up. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, I always so, I, I try to live by that, so, yeah. yeah. There we go. So, do you have a secondary question for it? Oh, okay. So, we're m- new topic. Yes. New topic. Okay. Let's see. I had mimes and clones. I'm gonna skip clones for this week. Um, so just mimes. So I wanted to ask a question about mimes, um, and I don't know how long this topic will last, but we have about 20 minutes. So, um, mimes. Uh, the the question the question in like you know encapsulated in a like digestible question is uh, how do mimes uh, how do mimes simulate beauty that's my question ah that's very good because they they do inherently limit themselves too they take the whole uh, language out of the equation uh, yeah yeah exactly as well as dress up primarily in that well, in a white and black style yeah because I I think there is like when you watch well some mimes are better than others. Um, but when you watch a lot of mimes, you like the mime himself or herself is n- you wouldn't say, "Oh, that person is beautiful," because they look weird. 
Um, they don't look beautiful or attractive or whatever. Well, I suppose they could be, but... Yeah. Okay. That's um, usually a, a personal judgment call. Uh, sure, like if you're into that sort of thing. <laughs> if mimes turn you on. Like or, well, you know, it could just be like, like you know, like the mime is some guy with like amazing pecs, biceps as big as our legs, and has a chiseled jawline, just amazing. Yeah, but like, have you ever, like, is that something you've ever pictured a mime <laughs> Before now? <laughs> Before now, no. Now I just can't get, you know, this this uh, you know amazing like Arnold Schwarzenegger mime thing out of my head. I like how you went to the, the male uh, epitome of beauty first. Well, there was, uh, let's say it was low-hanging fruit to describe beauty on the other end. And it could get me in trouble because I am a married man. Oh, I see. Okay, you're going that way. Okay. Besides, you know... Let's face it, there's more than enough cheesecake out there. Let's give a little, you know, mental beefcake to to the female mm-hmm. listeners. I, and the reason I picked this, the, like, as a question, because obviously we're, this is a entirely audio medium <laughs> in which we are talking about entirely visual medium. So I thought... Blogs that are the anti-mime. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Blogs and podcasts are... Well, that's... You blew my mind, man. Uh, good, good. Okay, so, so, yeah, so, but when you, like, a good mime can portray something that is beautiful, like, I, I don't know. How like a, it. like a nice, uh, a beautiful rose. Yeah, they, they can do that. Like, they often will, like, mimic, them yeah, they can, yeah, they can make, go up and mimic a, you know, like, uh, oh, this is a rose bush, and oh, careful, there's thorns, that's how you know they, they do the, oh, you know, I got... Oh, oh yeah, them. like with the finger, yeah. Yeah, and then they can yeah. pretend to, to get some shears and cut the rose off and ah, smell it nice underneath their nose and then give it off to somebody in the audience. Okay, and, and I love that because it's all simulating, like, um, a, a thing that we would find very visually beautiful and attractive, but that thing is completely absent from the, the performance. Hmm... Well, they do, uh, I suppose you can claim that in some sense mimes are conversing with us, but it's all body language rather than verbal. Uh, yeah, yeah. So okay. in which case, their use of, of beauty, it, it would be something like uh, showing us how we interact with beauty. So if you actually watch a mime, like interacting with something beautiful, artwork, rose, um, I don't know, maybe the mime's going out on a date with their significant other who happens to be beautiful. The whole thing yeah. can be portrayed, and then we can uh, you can effectively learn from watching the mime how y- you interact around something that is beautiful, um, even if yeah. you were not consciously aware of it before. So that's kind of interesting. Yeah. Most people just start thinking about where is the nearest you know rotten fruit to throw at this mime. <laughs> but let's let's face it, it's good artwork when that's done right. Um, I, I think so. Yeah, I mean a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of people say bad things about mimes, but. Um, they're an easy group to pick on because they don't uh, write back about anything. <laughs> yeah, right. They don't. I, I bo- they don't voice up. Wait, don't write back. <laughs> well, in this case, because you know we're working through the internet, uh, what are they going to do? Make a uh, podcast back at us if we naysay mimes? Oh, uh, now I want to start the mimes podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it might have to be more of like a video blog. Video that video. could actually be interesting for somebody who has the talent and the technology. That would be fun. Yeah. Might have to search YouTube later on tonight for that. Uh, th- yeah, somebody's probably already done it. Already. <laughs> and the best part is, it's not like we have to learn a language if they're doing it in another language, because it's mime work. It's, yeah, yeah exactly. it's It should be universal. Yeah, it should be. I, I, yeah, I want to see... Well, the the French mime is very stereotypical, and I, but I think that we kind of have a European culture in common with them, so we probably would understand them pretty well. I wonder if, like, an Indian or an African or a Chinese mime would, would be as understandable to us. See, that's, a, that's the interesting thing, is they should be uh, just as easy to understand or, or know what they're doing. Unless they're doing something we've never seen before. Uh, like, if they're... Okay, admittedly, I don't know a lot about um, uh, making clothes. Mm-hmm. So if there was a mime working on a loom, I probably wouldn't get most of what's going on for the small things. Like, I could get the yeah. back and forth on a loom thing properly, but that's about it. For all I know, they're using the old-fashioned charge cards to charge a lot of things to their visa. Oh, that could happen. But, uh, no, bec- 
like because you came up with that, I I think anything that's already in your brain, I think because that was already in your brain, you were able to come up with it. As I was thinking of something I don't know a lot of that could be mimicked without a lot of words. Mm-hmm. So I went okay. with a physical industry. What's something may be basic that uh, I, I have not experienced, like uh, oh, making clothes. That's right. I'm I'm wearing a fabric. I have no idea knows how to make. I know there's something specific that makes cotton into denim but I don't know that process myself. If I got sent back in time, these pair of jeans I'm wearing, that's it for my denim. Hmm. And that kind of saddens me a little bit. Well, what, sent back in time to before there was denim? Yeah, there was, there's been cotton for 12,000 years. Denim's what, 200 years old? About there. Okay. So, conceivably, if, if, if we'll say they're making, you know, denim from cotton, I wouldn't know what they're doing specifically to make that as opposed to any other cotton fabric. If a mime is is miming making denim, <laughs> I think that mime is probably going to be out of work fairly soon. <laughs> well, I didn't have to say they were a successful mime. Uh, yes, right. But uh, may- maybe you know they're they're just doing a long series on YouTube about what they're doing and all this, and, and they're working into like a how it's made sort of mime version. How it's made the mime version. Wow. We're just full of good ideas tonight. Now, if only we had an, as some sort of actor to help us out with this, we could really produce some mind-bogglingly unique content. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, well, okay. Conceivably, someone may have already... There's all there's 7 billion people. A decent amount of them have access to the Internet. There may be someone who's already got us on the idea. How it's made with no words. Uh, but yeah, maybe, maybe that like the the denim making mime has you know has this niche really cornered. Yeah. <laughs> so you know if if another denim making mime came on the scene, oh, you'd better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's the thing though is uh, with with the whole thing is uh is it depends on the audience. Is uh, with this mime who's making denim, maybe they're they're working like a it's a mime in a town that's uh, got a heavy cotton industry going on there, so. Okay. Maybe for them, it's not something that, that's weird. Maybe it's something that just seems natural. Because they've got 20 people in their family, and they're all making this sort of stuff every day. Yeah. So. Well, and it reminds me of the the African gumboot dancers. You know, basically, they're, uh, the I think they're gold miners from South Africa, and they would um, get together. I mean, they're all, bas- you know, working class. They, they work in the mines, and then they... They do these gumboot dances. Now, I can't remember why they do them. I, I think it's just entertainment, just because they happen to be wearing gumboots, and they make a cool sound when you slap your gumboots. Yeah. Um, but I was thinking also there might have been a use, like, down in the mines as for, like, you slap your gumboot, like, to let your... I slap my boots back and forth. I slap my boots back and forth. <laughs> no, 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 that's wrong. I mean, don't do that. <laughs> you, you let your fellow miners know where you are or something like that, or... I don't know, st- stomping around down the... In well, the don't mines. forget, I mean, you are standing the full time. You're in the mines. There's no sitting down work in the mine. So, you know, it could just be smack your boots to get to some feeling back in your feet. Mm, yeah, that could yeah, that could be it. It's not like they're walking on a carpet down there either. Um, if you, listener, who happen to be listening to this podcast, are a, um, African, a South African um, gumboot dancer... Uh, or just a miner, yeah. or just a miner, or a mime. You know, or if, a mime. You, if you have any connection to this, yeah, let's let's see what we can learn. Uh, yeah, give us a give us a shout. Um, we will eventually have an email address up uh, ready for you. Um, I think it's probably um, you can reach us at the simulationist, the simulationist at gmail dot com right now. Yes, I think that works in for the time being. We'll make sure that's set up before it ever gets out on the uh, the internet. Yeah. Uh, mm. And um, so, uh, well, I think beauty's an interesting thing, but could we work it with uh, like some of the other stuff? Like we we can imagine very easily how a mime would interact against something that is repulsive. Yeah. With the way their face goes, because let's face it, mimes are very facial uh, actors. Uh, yes. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah, because there are yeah universal human um, facial expressions, which see, which they've done research on, and they say these transcend culture. They're just basically biology. Like if if you are repulsed by something, you will make a certain face, no matter who you are. So they could work with that, and, and they could work with aggression too. Yep. Ah. Yep. 
I, I think beauty is a little hard because there's there's obviously there's happiness and appreciation, but like you know, beauty. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I like that you went with something that wasn't just something you know universal. You went with something that has maybe cultural differences going on with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. And various ways of, of going about it too, because let's, let's admit, admit it, the way you would uh, you know interact with a beautiful painting is not the same thing you would interact with like a beautiful piece of nature. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's, I find that you know uh, to be interesting, but uh, I think that might be a job for somebody in the sociology department of your nearest post-secondary educational facilities who could probably be, uh, be uh, best equipped to help you answer. How does a mime show beauty? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and by, yeah, simulate. So, yeah, thinking of the mime as, you know, doing another simulation um, in a weird way. Hmm. Now, here's an interesting thing. Would the mime themselves, in order to better simulate beauty, try and uh, make sure their makeup enhanced the bilateral symmetry we see as inherent beauty? Um, um, with the makeup... For the mime themselves, because let's let's face it, um, it is hard coded within the human body and mind that bilateral symmetry is good stuff. If you're not bilaterally sim- uh, symmetrical, you are not in- inherently seen as being as beautiful as someone who was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, even if it's just minor things like uh, one half closed eye. Well, yeah. thing. And then, of course, it does add character, so you can make an argument against that, but the brain is wired to see the symmetry of a of, of body. Uh, not even the human body, you know, like animals, you know, too. You know, if it, it's seen as a sign of health, and thus, I guess, betterness in some sense. Um, yeah, absolutely. But um, here's also where the um, uncanny valley comes in a little bit, because um, if you have something that's a l- slightly, like, non-symmetrical... I think that that triggers more of a like you don't consciously register it, but it feels wrong, and that's that's that uncanny valley. Whereas if there's something obviously different, like obviously unsymmetrical, then you could be like, oh, look at you know he's he's got like you know um, one half of his mouth goes up and the other half goes down or something like that. Uh. That's kind of obvious, like oh you know that's intentional and that's like interesting and it's kind of to catch attention because you know you have these. Um, these ladies' hats that are like, you know, the giant hats, and they go like at a slant, at about forty-five degree angle, at the jaunty tilt. Yeah, and it's like, like, why do they do that? Is that because that's attractive? Well, I was going to bring it up. Of uh, bilateral symmetry is big, but I have noticed you find very little by some, um, I don't know, uh, bilateral symmetrically hair designs that would require everybody parting their hair right down the center for it to work. Oh yeah, mohawks. <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, according to us, if you want to be hard lined on this, the only beautiful I hair do is something like a mohawk or the person who just parts it in the middle. But I would have a hard time imagining someone who does that. Oh, I suppose you might make a uh, call for ponytails, though, too. Yeah, sure. Ponytails, yeah. French braids. Yes. Pigtails sort of thing. Pigtails, yeah. But, uh, but yes, a lot of people don't have the uh, the symmetrical hair design. So that could be a symbol of character. No, their uniqueness. So, uh, in that case, the hat being on the head would be meant as like a um, a nice way to uh, to say this is like hair, but it isn't actually hair. So that way, I don't have to do weird stuff to it every dang day to make it like this. Yeah, yeah. I guess like yeah, psychologically, it, feel, it fulfills a similar role. Uh, that's basically hats do that. They they kind of stand in for hair, as uh-huh. far as our I think as our brain is. Like certain parts of our brain, not necessarily. With the bonus uh, aspect of keeping your head dry, you know, when it rains. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. there you go. Hmm. That's, I, I do find that interesting now that I think about it uh, on how, uh, you know, the, they say, oh, yes, it's a sign of health, but then we work with hair. And then you have people that even naturally ha- don't have the hairline split down the middle. When if that was uh, supposed to be seen as beautiful, that it, it would be apparently selected for. But some people, like, I know I don't, have uh, a natural hair parting down the middle. It parts off on the one side. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, you know, I, I think of, you know, characters from TV like Dwight Schrute would probably say, uh, 
off of the office, the guy off the office who has parts his hair down the middle, he would say something like, well, of course, like, I'm conventionally beautiful. I'm perfectly symmetrical. He does something like that. Because he's he has that kind of high opinion of his own genetics. Hmm. And I'm just recalling, too, for, for stuff like robots, when they, they do try and uh, mimic a human thing, uh, sometimes they'll have, like, uh, extra sub-eyes off on one side. Um helps them see in different wavelengths that humans can't perceive. But that's not seen as ugly. That's seen as novel. If, well, if it's on one side, just one side? Uh, well, you, I guess you can also see it with, uh, like, when they put on, like, uh, the, the super assassin puts on his sky, you know, spy master sky goggles or whatever, and he's got those little extra things on the one side that just look cool. Yeah. It doesn't make them symmetrical, but it does make them look more interesting. Well, an, an eye patch is, like, oh, yes. the person looks mysterious. When it doesn't make him look like a pirate. <laughs> Must be said. We're all thinking it right now. But yes. Yeah, well, I mean, or, you know, there, there are soap opera characters with eye patches. <laughs> yes, it's, it's meant to evoke the sense of mystery about them. Um, like, there's yeah. a story, because no, nobody just gets an eye patch one day. Something happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same with a scar. Why'd you get the scar? I can't tell you about that. You don't yeah. have clearance. But would you consider a sc- like a scar attractive, or do you think it's like main, kind of attractive on a man, less attractive on a woman? Or? Well, I guess it depends where it is, because that conventional scar that goes over top of the eye and slightly discolors the eye, so it's a little pale. You know, on, on, oh, yeah. on the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah that c- that can work just as well for uh, a woman as it does for a man. Okay. It does a. It, it can be said that oh no, it has you know destroyed the flawless beauty it was before. But I think it meant more than makes up in character. I guess it doesn't necessarily make a statement about that person's genes, unless it's just that they're reckless. That could be genetic, mm. I suppose. Uh, but other than that, it doesn't say that oh this person's genes are faulty. It's just oh they had an accident, which can happen to a perfectly. Uh, so then, yeah. genetic. So so then, uh, it's just one of the things where we would naturally, for the natural body form, we want to perceive the symmetry. But for the conscious choices and all that, we can we can see the difference between that and and the uniqueness for the asymmetrical style. Yeah. So that might explain the hairstyle thing. I don't know. Yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, we may have to put a pin in this for some other topic if we ever get somebody from the sociology stuff in here. Right, yeah, we might have to email somebody on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we're running in just at uh, 90 minutes now. Um, let's uh, see if we have any final wrap-up comments. I think this was a pretty darn good episode, I think. Uh, we came up with some unique ideas, not as feckin' as some of the ones we've come up with where you can just... anybody can hear it and come up with ideas, but... Uh, I think we came up with some really interesting stuff on this one. Yeah, exactly. And I hope that people will listen carefully to this podcast because I I feel like um, there are things that we can I, and we can also take from it and uh, and use this conversation that we have. Okay, um, yeah. We can I always come back to these sorts of things and go off on all sorts of other tangents if you uh, open our mind and and how, let us break the rules to to think up these cracks in the system. Exactly. Great rules. Okay, so thanks very much, listeners, for watching. I've been Josh Trelevin. I've still been Ryan Kirkby. And uh, same as mine.